Hi, I'm David Oyelowo. I'm an actor, a producer, and a director. Um, yeah, for me, becoming an actor, or I should say, becoming interested in acting and then eventually being an actor, started a bit later than it tends to do for um, others who, who take it up as a profession. I, I was sort of deeper into my teens before I even really entertained it as as a possibility. That's partly because coming from um, Nigerian parentage, at that time, culturally speaking, uh, being an actor was very, very, very low down on the rung of ambitions uh, in terms of my parents. You know, the arts were not really a place where they saw evidence of success for, for, for Black people. Um, and so when I started, well, the reason I started um, acting and becoming interested in acting is that I, <laughs> I fell from my pastor's daughter. This is when I was 15 and um, I was obsessed with her. And one day she asked me out on what I thought was a date and um, it was to the National Theatre. And uh, in, we arrived at the National Theatre. Instead of going in through the front doors, we went through the stage door up some stairs into a room where a group of young people were what I now know to be warming up. At the time, I thought she had taken me to join a cult um, because uh, warming up looked like, oh, and I just didn't, I had never seen that before. I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, and um, it was a youth theater that had been started at the National Theater by Susie Graham Adriani. Um, I was very shy. It wasn't something I particularly saw myself staying, uh, doing, but I liked her so much I kept going and I sort of gained a taste for it. And we ended up doing a show called The Disposables on what was the Cottesloe stage back then, um, the smallest venue at the National Theatre. And Susie started uh, this thing called Connections and it was sponsored by British Telecom, so it was called the BT Connections. And at the age of, I think I was 16 or 17, I ended up comparing the, uh, the BT Connections, the very first one with Sandy Toxvig on the Olivier stage. So that was my first experience of being on a big stage in a big venue like that. And it was, it was uh, BT Connections. And that's where it all sort of began for me. And I eventually went to drama school. I went to Lambda. Uh, three years of that, then the Royal Shakespeare Company, and then got into film and television, and it went on from there. Yeah, I mean, being an actor was just, it was, it was never some, I loved movies, I loved watching television, my mum used to call me a TV addict, um, but it just never felt like something that was accessible to someone like me. I had grown up, I was born in Oxford, but we lived in London, I was from the age of I was two to about six. Then we lived in Nigeria for from the age of six to 13 for me. And then we moved back. And just culturally speaking, it was just, there wasn't a path. You know, I didn't know how do you go on to become an actor? It wasn't really even something I thought about. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it, and it was because I didn't see much evidence of, real success. You know, you had to sort of think about Sidney Poitier, you had to think about Denzel Washington. These are the people I saw and went, oh, wow, they're doing it big. But even though we had amazing actors like David Harewood and Patterson Joseph and Hugh Corshi and, uh, you know, th they were, they were not being afforded the kind of opportunities that for a, for a younger Black actor made you feel like that is the pinnacle, that is Mount Everest, that is the, the zenith of what can be done. And, um, you know, that was, a, that was sort of a, that was the thing that, that, that I think made it something that, that was, that felt inaccessible to me. But the amazing thing about doing BT Connections and doing the youth theater uh, at the National was that Susie Gremediani saw something in me that I didn't see in me yet. 
Um, what actually happened is um, we were, like I say, doing, doing this play, The Disposables, and uh, there were three guys who were being groomed to play the lead. Um, they hadn't cast it yet, and there was a tube strike, uh, and all of them were stuck on trains. And Susie said, oh, okay, David, because I was always skulking in the back, didn't want any attention at all, um, just reading the part. And I, I guess I'd been observing for the months that I'd been in rehearsals in the back. Um, and I did the role the way I guess I'd been picturing it in my head. And um, I finished this monologue and every, everything stopped in the room and I was being stared at, which was sort of awful for me. Um, and I thought, oh, I, I clearly, just done that so badly that people are flabbergasted by how bad that was. And uh, it was actually quite the opposite. Within a week, I'd been cast in the lead. So the very first role I ever played, ever played, was um, a lead at the National Theatre. Um, and that was because Susie, like I say, saw something in me I didn't see in me yet. And there have been a handful of people through the course of my career who have advocated for me on the basis of what they saw in me. And I think that, that that's the difference maker. That's literally why I'm an actor today. There's, it's unfortunate because you don't want to live your life based on and built on the opinions of others. But unfortunately, as an actor, the only way you know you're any good is if people tell you you are. Um, and thankfully, I had the right people telling me I am. And uh, that's what encouraged me to, to keep going. Um, yeah, a formative moment in my career, you know, like I say, my, my parents were not supportive, really, of me becoming an actor. They're incredibly loving parents, incredibly encouraging parents, but they just couldn't see acting as, as a viable option for me. Um, but, you know, I did it anyway. Uh, like I say, I went to Lambda. The only way I could have gone to Lambda is you know, getting a scholarship. Getting the scholarship was the thing that swayed it for my dad. He couldn't understand acting, but he could understand scholarship and uh, someone paying for my for my time at Lambda. Uh, but he was—he still sort of always thought David will at some point get a proper job. And uh, I ended up, uh, I did my first season at the RSC was playing smaller roles. I was in three plays um, Anthony and Cleopatra, Volponi, and a play called Orinoco. Um, and then after that season, I was invited black, back to play Henry VI at the Royal Shakespeare Company um, in Henry VI part, parts one, two, and three. And um, that was a huge, huge, huge moment in my career. I didn't actually realize at the time of my casting that I would be the first black actor to be afforded the opportunity to play a king at the Royal Shakespeare Company. That sort of became a big piece of news for a while. To be honest, it became a bit of an unwanted pressure on me during rehearsals. Um, but the big thing for me, the, the plays did well and, and it was a formative moment in my career, as I say, but the big thing for me was my dad coming to see not one, not two, but all three plays in a day. On a Saturday, we would do Henry the Six Parts 1, 2, and 3. We would start at 10.30 in the morning and finish at 10.30 at night. And my dad sitting through 12 hours of Shakespeare is literally a miracle. Um, not only did he sit through it, but he uh, came up to me at the stage door afterwards and said, uh, he said, uh, I cannot believe they allowed a black man to play the King of England and it is my son. And um, that was the point beyond which he became my, my number one fan. And, uh, and all the encouragement that I'd lacked before becoming an actor was sort of given me a hundredfold. I think it was just such a... My dad came to the UK in the 60s and 70s, faced a lot of racism, a lot of bad stuff. And so I think seeing that in his own son was just something he never thought he would see for anyone who looked like him or I. So it being his son was huge. Um, so that was a, a seminal moment for me um, to see through my father's eyes um, 
something that I was being afforded um, that actually went on to really change the trajectory of my career. Uh, the advice I'd give anyone who's about to do NT Connections, considering doing NT Connections, or even just being an actor, is it's, of course, an incredibly enriching, fun, collaborative thing to do, just doing plays. You know, I'd advise anyone to do it just because of the skill set it gives you. You know, if, if public speaking is something that makes you nervous, doing plays will help with that. You know, you make lifelong friends because so much of doing a play or doing a show is about trusting other people and gaining their trust. That, of course, is the basis of building good relationships. Um, there's a physical element to it. There's a, gaining a command of language. There are so many life skills you gain from uh, doing plays and doing productions that don't necessarily mean you have to go on to become an actor. But if that is what you want to do, I would say that it should be the only thing you want to do. If there's something else that inspires you, that is likely to give you genuine satisfaction, I would give it a huge amount of consideration only because the thing that keeps you going with the sheer amount of rejection, humiliation, um, uh, confidence bashing, um, poverty <laughs> that can beset an actor. And I, and I mean that in real terms, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed. I've, I've been able to make a living doing it, but I went to drama school with people who were just as talented, if not more than me, and who are no longer doing it because there is an element of providence to this. There is, you know, if that girl hadn't asked me to the National Theatre, I probably wouldn't be sat here right now. Unfortunately, that is also part of this business. You could argue that is part of life, but particularly this business. I mean, sometimes it is being in the right place at the right time. It is being in the right production at the right time. It is being in the right film that happens to resonate with an audience in a way that it would do now, more so than it would have done if it came out last year. There are so many mitigating factors. And if that's something you can stomach, if that's something you can live with, the fact that your talent actually isn't enough, then I would pursue it because that's what keeps you going when all of those hurdles are being met and they will come your way no matter how successful uh, you become. The one thing you can control, the two things you can control as an actor is your work rate. You know, the best actors I've worked with, it's not just their talent, it's how much work they put into it. If you love sports like I do, I love boxing, I love mixed martial arts, and you can have great talent and that'll get you through the first few rounds. But the thing that makes champions is your cardio. And that's to do with your work rate. That is to do with how many hours you put in in the gym so that your skill level doesn't drop when you're tired. And if you rely purely on your talent, you will burn out. You will have a few rounds and people will move on. Um, but, you know, my favorite actors, whether it be Daniel Day-Lewis or Denzel Washington or Judi Dench or Kate Winslet or Saoirse Ronan or, you know, these, these actors who just consistently throw down great performances, it's their work rate. You can tell that they are not resting on their laurels. So, so there's, there's that. And the, and the other thing I would say is um, be a nice person, be kind, be, be good to other people. Like I said, you know, one of the great things about being an actor, one of the great things about being part of this fraternity of actors is you do make lifelong friends. It is a collaborative thing. It's not the loneliness of being a writer in a room on your own. It's not um, the loneliness of other artistic endeavors, being a painter, for instance, you know, there are people who like that. You have to be a people person if you want to be an actor. Um, and the place I have found the best actors I have worked with, the place they dwell is service. Serve the story, serve the audience, serve your fellow actors. If you're coming from a place of service, 
you are inadvertently serving yourself because that's what makes you better. The best acting is listening, not acting. That is a an act of service. You know, you are you are being generous by virtue of listening as opposed to just doing. And if you can have that as an ethos, as a way of thinking, as a way of approaching the craft of acting, longevity will be yours because people like being around people who are selfless and generous and kind and who put other people first. In the same way that you will burn out if you rely purely on your talent, you will burn out if you're not a nice person. And so, unfortunately, an occupational hazard of being an actor is self-obsession. Um, and um, you've got to really try and wrestle that to the ground. One of the greatest things for me was becoming a father. You know, I have four children. I'm not saying everyone who is going to be an actor needs to have children, but inadvertently they gave me the gift of looking beyond myself. And I think that truly is a gift. If you can give that to yourself early on, you'll do well. <laughs>